Hi, welcome to Hope Online. My name is Ange and it is great to have you with us. Today we have our Hope Worship team leading us in our worship and John Groves will be speaking to us as he continues our preach series as we're looking at the first couple of chapters in the book of Genesis. And as we go into our time of worship this morning, I want to encourage you with some uh, verses from one of the Psalms. Psalms is a book of the Bible and I'm going to read from Psalm 95 verses 1 to 7. And I want to encourage you to let it stir your spirit this morning. Let it encourage you to stir your soul as we go into our time of worship together. So I'm going to read Psalm 95 and it's verses 1 through to 7. It says, Come on, everyone, let's sing for joy to the Lord. Let's shout our loudest praises to our God who saved us. Everyone, come meet his face with a thankful heart. Don't hold back your praises. Make him great by your shouts of joy. For the Lord is the greatest of all, King God over all other gods. In one hand, he holds the mysteries of the earth, and in the other, he holds the highest mountain peaks. He's the owner of every ocean, the engineer and sculptor of earth itself. Come and kneel before this creator God. Come and bow before this mighty God, our majestic maker. For we are those he cares for, and he is the God we worship. So let's worship that God together this morning. Yeah. 
chased down my heart through all of my failure and So we've just been singing a song that talks about the fact that we worship a God who spoke stars into place, spoke and the galaxies were formed, and yet also created me and you. He created men and women to worship him, to have a relationship, a friendship with him. And if you are watching Hope Online this morning and you are not yet a Christian, then this morning you could be, you could ask Jesus into your heart today. And it's just as simple as saying, Jesus, come into my heart. Jesus, would you come into my life today? So if you're thinking about it, I want to encourage you that maybe that is something for you to say to Jesus today. And then let somebody know. If you um, are friends with somebody who's a Christian and Jesus follower, let them know that that is what you have just done. Or let us know at Hope Online. We would love to hear about it and connect some more in with you afterwards. Well, I'm going to hand over to John now as he continues our preach series. Good morning, Hope Church. Uh, this morning we're going to continue in our series Beginnings. Uh, and we're going to look at Made for Purpose. And I'm going to base what I say on some verses in Genesis chapter 1. So I'm just going to read those to you straight away. Verses 26 to 31 of Genesis chapter 1. Then God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God he created him, male and female he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of the earth, and every tree with seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the heavens, and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has breath of life in it, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. Now, last week, Tim spoke excellently on verses 26 and 27. And I don't want to unnecessarily duplicate areas that Tim so helpfully explored. But I do believe it's not uh, a bad thing to have some overlap because there are so many fundamental truths about humanity 
uh, truths that are important to all of us, every single person watching me this morning, to every human being, and truths that I'm sad to say are quite often under attack today and uh, actually are, are being undermined and in some cases twisted. And so we must clearly and repeatedly state the truths that are in the Bible about who we are, why we're here, what we're meant to be doing and how, we, how we're meant to interact with one another. We want to counteract the lies, frankly, that are so all pervasive in our culture in 21st century uh, Britain. And so uh, in a way, I don't make an apology for some overlap, although I will mostly cover fresh ground. And I, I'll probably quite quickly go through a number of points and linger a little more on the last one. By the way, the truth that I'm just going to quickly uh, explain and heighten and show you this morning, uh, highlight this morning, these truths are classic Christian doctrine. They are essentially things that real Christians have believed for the last 2000 years. There's nothing that's like just new. Oh, right. In the 21st century, 20th century, we've decided this. In fact, it's the other way. And I would argue that many of these truths have strongly influenced our culture. The roots of our Judeo-Christian her heritage have influenced how we think, how we think about human rights, how we think about individuals, how we think about lots of aspects of life. And you'll see, I think, that as I just highlight these this morning, these are the foundations of a lot of what we believe even still and the way we behave. So I'm gonna quickly go through some big truths that come out of these verses, truths about us, about human beings. And the first one is we're made in the image of God, which, of course, was where Tim was last week. We human beings are not God. We are distinct from God. We are created by God and we are accountable to God. However, we are a special creation. We were created last of all. We were, if you like, handmade, according to the stories here in early chapters of Genesis. God's very special creation. Human beings have got unique features. They can conceptualize, they can evaluate and plan and create and speak and communicate in complicated ways. All aspects of their unique made in the image of God uh, uh, ways. Men and women can also have fellowship with God. God communicates with us very clearly, he communicates through words and his word, and we can communicate with him. We are not only creatures, we are persons. And in that sense, maybe we also reflect a little of God, three persons in one God. We are persons. We are people who can make decisions and choices for ourselves and think through what we're doing and sort of know the consequences. We have free will and free will goes with, with, with it goes a certain responsibility. God has made us also self-aware and we are responsible for the choices we make and for the actions we take. So each individual, male and female, bears the image of God. And that gives great worth to every individual human being. Human worth is not based on your usefulness to society, your possessions or your achievements or your physical attractiveness or how much you have public acclaim. It's based on the fact that you were made in the image of God. You are a unique person. There's no one exactly like you, but you, like the rest of us, have been made in God's image and are valuable to him and have eternal value, actually, because of that. So another in, uh, sort of consequence is that if we hate, despise, denigrate, curse, wrong, abuse, actually kill another human being, we are doing something seriously wrong. And the whole Bible reflects that man made in the image of God for, for us to despise them and treat them, abuse them and treat them badly or even to kill them selfishly and for our own ends. These things are very serious sins and we are answerable to God for them. God loves each individual. Each one is made in his image and each one is responsible to him and accountable to him for their own behaviour and for the way they behave towards other men and women. OK, that was the first thing. Let's look at the second one now. Human beings were made male and female. Both men and women equally are made in the image of God. The two sexes, and there are only two, 
were made complementary. They are two halves of a whole. In every sense, they fit together and they were made to work together, to work well together, to actually express the image of God most completely when they were in harmony working together. The mandate given in verse 28 to multiply and be fruitful and fill the earth and rule over it is clearly given to them. It's given to the male and the female. It's given to men and women together. The mandate could not be accomplished if it was just done by one half, the male half, for example. It will not be achieved without both men and women working together with a sort of equality, yet a complementarity. Men and women then were made to be in harmony together, to display a sort of mutual honour and respect and to embrace the task that God had given them equally and together to embrace it. Let's go to the third thing we can draw from these early chapters of Genesis. Made from one couple. Now, this truth is really unpacked in Genesis chapter 2, uh, and, but I want to emphasise it this morning because I think it is very fundamental. The Bible teaches that God created one man and one woman, Adam and Eve, as the source of all humanity. There were then at the beginning no hier hierarchies, no divisions. There was a certain purity to that first creation. Now, through the millennia, much has happened. Sin has developed and diversified and multiplied amongst us. I would actually say there's been microevolution because I think that goes on within species as people adjust to diets and climates and all sorts of contexts. So humankind has diversified. There's no question about that. Different races are there. Different races have developed, different types of people, different abilities, different sizes and classes, different tribes and nations. But sadly, as these have developed with the sin effect, there have come in huge clashes, struggles, exploitation and horrible behaviour and, of course, wars, horrible behaviour one to another. But this fundamental truth that we're looking at still stands. And actually, it was re-emphasised in the New Testament. Here's uh, Paul preaching at Athens, and he's talking to Greeks who didn't know much about the Bible or the Old Testament at all. And he says this. It's Acts 17, verses 26 to 27. He's talking about God. He, God, made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place, that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way towards him and find him. Yet he is actually not far from any one of us. Now, that truth, we all have one maker, whoever we are, whatever race or type or class, we all have one ancestral father and mother, that is classic Christian doctrine. And true Christians, the best of Christians, have always believed it and have endeavoured to live in the light of it. Now, you can find a lot of examples historically, but I'm just going to give you one little one. This is from a Puritan writer. We're going back nearly 400 years, over 350 years, to Matthew Henry. And here is what he's saying about the truth I've just referred to. Matthew Henry says... God made one male and one female that all the nations of men might know themselves to be made of one blood, descendants of common stock, and might thereby be induced to love one another. Lovely old language, but a profound truth. We all actually come from one stock. We've all actually made from one blood. And actually, modern DNA would support a lot of that. And Therefore, God made it like that so that we might not be fighting each other, but might be in harmony and be induced to love one another across the classes and the nations and the races. Let's move on to the fourth uh, sort of fundamental that I believe we can find in these verses. We were made stewards of the earth. Human beings are made in the image of God and set apart from other creatures. But then they are commissioned to be God's representatives on the earth, his stewards of the earth. We are to steward the earth on God's behalf. Sort of his ambassadors, or to use an old phrase, his vice regals, those who represent the king 
and uh, are answerable and accountable to the king for what they do. We were made to communicate freely and easily with God, the creator of everything, and then to obey him and, as it were, uh, serve him by looking after what we lived amongst, the world we lived on and the animals that were around us, to steward it well. We were expected to manage it, to develop it. We had a degree of freedom and uh, free will and creativity and to uh, ex not, not exploit it, but to make good use of it. We'll come back to that in a moment. And it was a great privilege and a great responsibility. I say not exploit it because I think that's important. There's a distortion of some of this doctrine historically where people say, well, that, the earth's there for us just to use. No, let's be careful what we're saying here. In verse 28, there are two words that are a little jarring to our ears, subdue and have dominion. But I want you to listen carefully because the idea of dominion here is clearly in the ancient text, the idea of what we would call an ideal monarch, an ideal benign monarch who is supposed to rule his people for their good, to serve them by ruling them well and to protect them from danger and to promote their well-being. Now, the word subdue in itself, in the original language, is rather similar to some words used elsewhere in these early chapters. Uh, for example, work the land in Genesis 2, 5, till and keep the land, which comes up later. So it probably means exactly that, till and keep the land a freedom to grow plants, to uh, not just pick things off the trees, but to cultivate and develop for the good of all. So these commands were empowering human beings to have certain dominion in the world, but for the good of themselves and their descendants and for the general well-being even of the animal world. It was not a right to abuse or to kill or, or to wantonly exploit. And it might be worth noting in verse 29 that this initial uh, creation mandate did not include the prerogative to kill animals for food. Quite clearly, they were only eating plant food. It's very clear there, They're vegetarian, if you like. So there was not an exploitation of the animal world just to satisfy your own um, uh, greed. So animals and humans were made a bit similar but us human beings were to be in charge and ruling it on God's behalf. We are very similar to the animals in many ways. We're made on this last day. We're created like they are. We're just creatures. We're earthbound. We need food. We uh, have sex. We bear offspring. And we are broadly in the same classification, even here in the creation. But we were a special last creation of that day. And we have responsibilities. Let's move on to our fifth one. The fifth thing that we pick up from here is that we were made for work. That's interesting, isn't it? God's original design for men and women included work. Before the fall, before the fall, men and women were commissioned to fill the earth, to work the ground and till it, as we've just seen, and to look after and keep the Garden of Eden. That will come up in chapter two and to name the animals. That also comes up in chapter two. So there's some effort and planning and, and, and direction involved there, managing, if you like. We were the active managers of this beautiful planet and we had plenty to do. So work was seen as basically good. After all, God worked. He doesn't rest till the seventh day. So God himself worked in creating the world. We are all called to work. And many of us to work in several different ways, which was also true then in the beginning because they are being commissioned to have children and to multiply, to look after the animals and to name them, as we've seen, but also to till the ground and to labour, to create, to plan, all sorts of things like that. So there's a, a, a multiplicity of work, there's different sorts of work, and some people, probably many people, most people, will do more than one type. Now, that's quite a startling thing when you let it first sink in. Let me uh, just read a few ver a few lines from Tim Keller, who makes a comment on this, this point from Genesis 1. Let's just look at that. G Tim Keller writes, The book of Genesis leaves us with a striking truth. Work was part of paradise. Work is as much a basic need as food, beauty, rest, friendship, prayer and sexuality. It is not simply medicine, 
but food for our soul. In the beginning, no one was made to be idle. No one was made to exploit others, to sit and do nothing while others did all the work. No one was made to be purposeless or expendable or unnecessary or lazy or exploited. God made work and it was good. Indeed, along with everything else, verse 31 tells us it was very good. Now, quite clearly, something has gone wrong. Many things especially in the areas I've just been quickly listing to you, do not appear very good in our present world. It's not the term we'd use about those sort of things. In fact, in all the areas we've just looked at, you probably wouldn't th say things were very good, not on a world scale. Think about the value and importance of each individual, the sanctity of each individual's life. Think about the clarity of the male and female role and the clarity of the two sexes. Think about the complementarity, but also mutual honour and respect and equality. Think about the fundamental unity of all human beings, every race, class and nation coming from the same source and all of equal worth. Think about the care and stewardship of the earth and not exploiting it, and the care and, and, and looking after all the animal kingdom. Think about the idea of a joyful, stress-free, rewarding work life, which was thoroughly satisfying. And to call any of these areas very good today would almost seem like a bit of a joke, really. But that was not so at the beginning. And we do need to look at the creator's original plan in order to realise how far we've fallen from that original blessed position that God had for us. We have to be realistic sometimes. We have to think, yeah, there are bits of this that remain. Thank God. It's not all terrible, not at all. But we are quite a long way short of where we should be. And the full story of why that is and what went wrong is in Genesis 3. And we'll clearly look at that another day. There's not time for that this morning. But suffice to say that men and women basically rebelled against God, turned their backs on him, said, we will be our own gods. We won't do anything just because you say so. We'll decide our own right and wrong and we'll rule for ourselves, literally for ourselves and for our benefit. And we won't not be answerable to you, God. And in choosing to go their own way and decide their own right and wrong, they began a process of terrible infection or, or impurity. Sin, it's called in the Bible. But it's, it, there are individual sins that are clearly wrong. And we can all see that. Murder, rape, hatred, that sort of thing. You know, robbery and violence. But there are a lot of very subtle sins that we all harbour. Pride and greed and envy and selfishness. And, and all of these things produce pollution, as it were, right across humankind and actually across the world we live in. And then comes out of this uh, selfish, we'll decide what's right and wrong, that, that comes out of that a confusion. And you don't need me to spell out for you the confusion in our own morality today, a confusion about issues of sexuality, about even just the moral issues of what's right and wrong in those areas. The confusion which uh, Tim touched on so uh, movingly, really, last week about why we would abort some babies and, and not others. Or actually, if you, to be very honest, why we would spend, as we have done the last 12 months, absolutely breaking our backs and breaking our economy, really, to spare the lives of people who we don't want to die, but because we value them. But mostly the people who die of COVID are in the older age group, probably over 80. One of the average age of deaths is 82, I think. But meanwhile, in the last 12 months, probably nearly quarter of a million babies have been aborted in the UK. So there is something wrong with the way we make our choices. And we just have to accept we're not where we should be. The world of men and women has indeed been polluted by sin. And that has affected the world creation again. Just see the state it's in. Now, the serious state of our world, which I think we're all getting increasingly aware of, is sort of due to our ignoring of God and his ways, exploiting it purely for our own ends. And, and human sin and selfishness probably is quite a driver on the way we've damaged our world. So 
Whatever way you look at it, we need help. And God has provided it. Let's move on to our last point. Made whole in Christ. Because God made human beings in his image, he longs to redeem us. He loves us and he doesn't want to leave us to our own devices. We've ignored him, but he hasn't ignored us. God loves the world and he wanted to restore us human beings to a place where we once were. In fact, to a higher place, strictly speaking, where we become his children and part of his family. But it is essentially a restoration back to how we're meant to be in good harmonious connection with him, reconciled to him. So God had to provide a way of dealing with our sin problem. Holy as he is, it had to be dealt with and therefore reconcile us to himself and be able to renew us and restore us. Because even though we're fallen, not only are we still loved of God, we still ca carry his image. The image of God hasn't been completely removed and God wants to see us back with him. So his, his own son came in the image of men and women. Jesus came as a man and uh, he lived on earth and lived in this sin sick world and suffered the consequences of that. But he went beyond that. He came to die, to die on the cross. And in doing that, the Bible is very clear. He was bearing our sins in his body on the tree, on the cross. And he died for you and I to redeem us, to reconcile us to God, to restore us to where we should be in harmony with our creator. And that is a great hope for every one of Adam and Eve's fallen sons and daughters. This wonderful hope of salvation, it applies to all who were in Adam. And we're all in Adam, whatever race or class or, or type of person we are, male, female, whatever we are, we were in Adam or we are in Adam. And through the gospel, there is an opportunity to come into Christ to be in Christ, to be born again by the Holy Spirit and become a child of God and be no longer in Adam primarily, but in Christ, the second man. Now, if you're a Christian, you'll know those verses I've been referring to. I certainly haven't time to, it's not my main subject this morning, to unpack that teaching, but it's a wonderful truth. To each one of you, I would say the offer of today is there to come out from the old and into the new, to no longer be in Adam, but to come in Christ. Now, when that happens, we can be renewed and remade and restored to the image of the creator as we should be. Look at, listen to these verses from Colossians 3, 9 and 11. Do not lie to one another. He's talking about one of the many effects of sin, seeing that you have put off the old self and its practices and have put on the new self. This is what it is to be a Christian. We're in the new man, the new in Christ. You've put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. We are being renewed back to be more like God. Here there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. So when you're in Christ, there is a restoration of some of the truths, indeed all of the truths ultimately, that I've already touched on this morning dealing with the conflicts and divisions and wars and troubles between men and women, between different sorts of people, between slave and free, between Greek and Jew and, and so on and so forth. It's a wonderful truth that comes through the gospel. And, you know, the gospel restores in every area. In the last few minutes of my talk, I want to illustrate something from the last point I made about made for work, because believe it or not, the gospel restores work. Remember, I told you that work uh, is part of how we were made. It was originally very good. Now, of course, it, it lost that very good feel after the fall into sin. In fact, there was a curse on work. You can read that in Genesis 3, a curse of sin. And it became troublesome and difficult. But Jesus died to redeem us from the curse. What does the curse mean for work? Well, it's probably many things, but you could say we, in our work, we can end up driven and striving or, or greedy, or lazy, or exploited, or exploiting, or overworked, or people-pleasing, or perfectionist, or idolatrous about our work, or very proud of it. And all of these things poison it. 
But the gospel came to set us free from all that. Jesus came to save us from all that and to change our attitude to work. And that actually comes out later in the same chapter, Colossians 3, verses 23 to 24. Whatever you do, speaking to Christians who are in Christ, whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. When you become a Christian, when you come in, into Christ, you begin to live differently in every single area and it all begins to restore you back to where you should be. And even your work can be redeemed because you learn that you're actually working for Jesus. You're working to serve him. And the joys and the sorrows that are so tied to your own personal success at work or failures or how people treat you, they begin to fade back as you establish who you are in Christ. Your identity in Christ begins to give you a security and a stability, even in the ups and downs of the working world. And we realise we can glorify God by our attitude and by our actions at work. And even different seasons and circumstances. If you're cleaning a room, do it as serving the Lord Jesus. If you're writing an email, do it as serving the Lord Jesus. Greeting a customer, do it as serving the Lord Jesus. Teaching a class, do it as serving the Lord Jesus. Building a wall, do it as serving the Lord Jesus. Cooking a dinner, do it as serving Lord Jesus. We could go on through every single thing. Just look at this quote, I love it, from Martin Luther. This is again, a long time ago, probably written 500 years ago, but let me read it to you. Martin Luther says, the maid who sweeps her kitchen is doing the will of God just as much as the monk who prays. Not because she may sing a Christian hymn as she sweeps, but because God loves clean floors. The Christian shoemaker does his Christian duty not by putting little crosses on the shoes, but by making good shoes, because God is interested in good craftsmanship. All work honours God. All work is valuable to him. Whatever job you're doing, even if you're stuck in a job you don't like, you can do it for the Lord Jesus, out of love for him and out of honouring him and knowing that he appreciates what you do. And you can also do it out of love for your neighbour. There can be a love for others that comes through as well. So work can be redeemed, just as all the rest of our created um, purposes can be redeemed. God made us for purpose. We lost the way, lost the plot. But that plot is restored in and through Jesus Christ. So as I close, I just want to pray for you. I'm actually going to pray particularly into that work situation as we close. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you that you made us for work. Lord, I pray that every one of us listening this morning will be given your wisdom and your grace to navigate the work season we, that they find themselves in right now. Lord, it's been a strange time with furloughs and and businesses folding and other people perhaps doing fine and working from home and feeling a bit isolated. Lord, will you come and give fresh faith for work, fresh grace for work. Help us to love our neighbours through our work. Help us also, Lord, to, to love you with what we do. Lord, please reveal if we've lost our way and, and got uh, idolatrous about work or, or got very angry and bitter about it. Lord, restore our love for you and our love for others. Help us to have the grace to negotiate through what we're being asked to do. And I pray, Lord, that your kingdom will come and your will will be done on earth in the workplaces of my friends listening to me as truly as it is in heaven. May they bring a bit of heaven to their work, Lord, even this week. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.
of my present, God of my future, you write my story, you hold it all together, God of my present, God of my future, you write my story. so great to worship God together and hear from him and if you would like prayer for anything today then we have a great prayer team who would love to pray with you you can click on the link in the live chat and also below whether that is um, prayer for breakthrough or healing or you've got pain in your body or just something that you're praying for at the moment that you would love some other people to join in with you and pray with you for then do click on those links and we also have a Zoom cafe. This happens at 11 a.m. on Zoom. And again, the link is in the live chat and below. And you can click on those links to connect in with other people who have been watching Hope Online today and connect in with each other. And then lastly, don't forget to keep following us on all our social media. Hope Church Winchester would love to keep connecting in with you. So have a great rest of your day and enjoy your week. And we'll see you next week. <laughs>